Okay, today's message is called Ghosted, but I would call it Ghosted in the House. Ghost in the House, okay? We're at 2 Kings chapter 4 from the message, beginning with verse 1. This is the inerrant, the inspired, the infallible word of the living God that's able to change you and save you. Listen to this. One day the wife of a man from the guild of prophets called out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. You well know what a good man he was, devoted to God, and now the man to whom he was in debt is on his way to collect by taking my two children as slaves. Elisha said, I wonder how I can be of help. Tell me, what do you have in your house? Nothing, she said. Well, I do have a little oil. Here's what you do, said Elisha. Go up and down the street and borrow jugs and bowls, vessels from all your neighbors, and not just a few, all you can get. Then come home. Everybody say, come home. Then come home and lock the door behind you You and your sons, the next generation, pour oil into each container when each is full, set it aside. She did what he said. She locked the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the containers to her. She filled them. When all the jugs and bowls were full, she said to one of her sons, another jug, please. He said, that's it. There are no more jugs. Then the oil stopped. There are no more vessels. Then the oil stopped. She went and told the story to the man of God. He said, go sell the oil, make good on your debts, and live, both you and your sons, on what's left. I want to weave in Psalm 92, a couple of parts there, verses 10. David writes, but my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Everybody say fresh oil. I've been anointed with fresh oil. Verse 13, those who are planted And the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Let's pray one more time. God, would you open the eyes of our hearts? Change us from the inside out. Holy Spirit, oil of God, come and move in this place as only you can do. Take this voice bring healing to me, but let people hear what you want to say, not what I want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. I just finished a um, series called Ghosted just last week in my church. And, um, you know, ghosted in this generation, the world's definition is to be suddenly rejected and abandoned as if you never had a relationship in the first place to be canceled or blocked on all devices and platforms. If you, you, can, you can be in relationship with somebody right now in 2023 and you're going good and you, and, and you feel uh, maybe there's a future, maybe there's a, just a friendship, maybe it's about a spouse, a future thing. You feel this thing, this connection, and all of a sudden in 2023, somebody can hit one button and block you, stop you, ignore you, pretend you never existed, and break your heart. But to be holy ghosted is the opposite. To be holy ghosted is to be loved and accepted by God. No matter what, he will never, ever, 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 ever abandon you or reject you. He will never, listen, he loves you even when you don't understand it. He loves you even when you don't love yourself. He loves you because he loves you. He loves you, and he will never, ever, 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 ever reject you, abandon you, cancel you, walk out on you. See, a lot of us were taught in the in old school church that every time we sinned, the Holy Spirit would leave us. He would lift his presence off of us. That's a very Old Testament picture of God, but that's not the New Testament picture of Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us, and he doesn't move out when we mess up. He, he's still within us. He's still around us. He's still encouraging us, and he's still lifting us up. He's still rooting for us. It, the, there's, not, there's not an in and out, up and down. Listen, right now, the church needs to be hope distributors. Right now, we need to be distributors of hope because the world is hopeless, and they're looking for love and acceptance right now. We can't affirm everything, but we can accept everyone, right? We can't affirm everything, but we can accept everybody. Because Jesus loved people. Listen, he, Jesus hung out with people, and it was the religious crowd that was mad. The religious people were upset. What are you hanging around with her for? Don't you know she has a past? Don't you know? He says, who's forgiven much loves much. 
You don't know what she's done, but she's here. You, you didn't do this for me, and she's here cleaning my feet with her tears. I mean, she loves because, listen, Jesus loves us so much, and the problem is we forget about it. Now, that's, that, let me just qualify this. God's love is not permissive. That doesn't mean it's a license to go do whatever the heck you want to do. That's the opposite. See, that's licentiousness. That's using your liberty as an excuse to keep on sinning without, being, without responding to the conviction of God. No, no, no. His love is so good that once you get into it, you don't want to keep going like you were going. You want freedom. You want to lean into it. And so in this passage I read to you from 2 Kings 4, I saw something this just a few weeks ago that really changed me, that really did something in me. And I've preached this passage many times. I think I even preached it here years ago from a completely different perspective. But when I saw this, listen, in St. Kings 4, it's a story of a frightened, lonely widow who's asking for help from a man of God. The creditors are coming to take their sons, her sons away because her husband was a pastor, was a prophet of God, Old Testament priest, prophet of God. He was in the Guild of Prophets. But he had run up some debts. How many know you could you can be serving God and still get some in some financial messes at times and <clears throat> make some rough decisions? Well, he died. He didn't have any insurance policy. Well, that's that's another whole sermon. Anyway, and he and, and and he and he didn't know he didn't leave his wife in good shape. And so in those days they would come and they would take your children as indentured servants. That doesn't mean getting false teeth. Uh, uh, anyway, I just want to make sure you're awake at eight thirty. Anyway, so. Um, he, it doesn't mean that they, that they uh, uh, were going to, you know, be there, uh, you know, forever and ever, but they would be, become slaves to work off that debt. We call, it, we call it human trafficking today. But basically, these people had a right to come and take her kids. This is a mom in panic. This is a mom. Just put yourself in that position. How many of you love your kids? How many, how many would do anything for your kids to keep them from being in bondage? to keep them from going to prison or going to be a slave someplace. You'd do anything, right? Well, this is the same way this mother feels. And she comes to her husband's old boss and says, look, I need God to do something for me. And the prophet asks something that's just kind of bizarre. First he says, what do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do? Before she can answer, he says, he gets that prophetic, hmm, and he says, tell me, what do you have in the house? What do you have left? And her first response, for people that are going through something and losing things, they, they'd already taken, obviously, furniture. They'd already taken, she, she didn't say, I had a bed. She, said, she says what most of us would say when we're going through a challenge. I got nothing. I got nothing left. She said a man in our community went through a fire the other night. His house burned to the ground, but he made out with his, with his life. And he's going, I got nothing left. And then people are surrounding him and taking care of him. I want you to know that this woman, she felt like she had nothing. But then she thinks, I have one little jar of oil. And the man of God says, okay, we can work with that. We can work with that. You know, the oil in the, in the Old Testament always speaks of the Holy Spirit. The anointing oil always talks about the Holy Spirit and the movement of the Holy Spirit, the freedom of the Holy Spirit to move. He says, what do you have in the house? He says, what do you have? One translation says, what do you have in your house? The other translation says, what do you have in the house? I want to ask that question a little different in a little different way today. I'm going to ask you this. What do you have in the house of God. What do you have in this house or wherever you go to church if you're visiting? What do you have in the house? Do you have a casual interest, an attendance, some small commitment, or are you invested? Have you put down deep roots into God's house, the church of Jesus? Because that's the issue. Listen, I just heard a statistic. I was at a pastor's conference a month ago <clears throat> and the, um, there was a discussion about uh, Barna Research Group and some of the Christian research they do and statistical analysis. Since COVID, they're saying that, like, there, there, are, there are pastors that are on the verge of quitting all over America because they're so discouraged. 
because only about 60% of the people that were in the church before COVID are actually in the same church, 60%. That means 40% of people they thought were there ghosted them in some way. 40%, some went to another church, and some, over like 16%, never went back to any other church. They just kind of view, they kind of do a la carte online. Oh, I'll take that from this week, and I'll do a podcast from that guy, and I'll do this and that. Let me tell you something, my friends. When God moves, God works through a house. He doesn't work through a whole bunch of talking heads. He works through a vision. He works through a common mission, vision, and values. That's what a church is. That's what a church is supposed to be. Not supposed to be a religious place where we're all, you know, I'm trying to be kind here, but we, we, you know, it's not a place to come if you've got a stick up your butt, okay? It's not a place to come. I'm sorry for the visual, but I get so frustrated with religious people. Religious people frustrated Jesus. People that wanted mercy and grace, Jesus never had a problem with. He just, he just received them. He just welcomed them. He just had them come around him. They wanted to be around him. They didn't feel condemnation. They felt love. Kids wanted to be around him. You can't fool children. The Bible says Jesus, that kids were running up and jumping in Jesus' arms. And it was the disciples who said, hey, hey, take your kids away from me. Master's busy. He said, what did he say? He rebuked the disciples. He said, no, you don't understand. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. The next generation, let them come to me. They don't want to come if, if he's, look, you know, you know, you see the pictures of Jesus on the stained glass windows sometimes? He looks kind of sad. He always looks kind of weak and sad, doesn't he? He looks real religious because that's what religious people think of him as. But that's not my father. That's not my father. That's not the, that's not the Holy Spirit that I know. I mean, he, you know, you're still, listen, if you're born again today, you are God's kid. And there's something about a father and their kids. Sometimes they want to throw you up in the air and sometimes they want to wrestle with you. It's different than a, a father's love is different than a mother's love, but it's still, it can still be fun and strong. But two generations ago, fathers didn't even know how to hug their kids and say, I love you. Today, we're, we've learned uh, in all the times, man, this is the time for dads to be involved and dads to be present in the home, right? So what do you have in the house? Have you put down the roots, the deep roots that you need to? The widow woman replies when he says, what do you have in the house? She said, I got nothing but a jar of oil, a little bit of oil. My friends, sometimes we don't recognize, understand, or appreciate what we have until we lose it. And I'm concerned at times that you, you've got to esteem what you have here. This is, this is a miracle in the last almost nine years. This church is a miracle. I talk about this church all over the world. I've preached in 83 nations. I was just in Cuba for the first time five, six weeks ago, five, six weeks ago. Changed my life. God did so much in me. And, and took me to that country. I've been praying for that country for over 30 years. I talk about this church all over the world because of this is a miracle. What you have here is amazing. It's a relationship. You are shifting a, a city, a community that has uh, state impact and international impact from right here. You and Seward, uh, you, you have so much opportunity in Seward to make a difference in that community. God wants to do something in you, for you, through you. But you have to understand, sometimes people don't, under, don't appreciate freedom till they lose it. They don't appreciate relationships till they're gone. They don't appreciate peace. A simple thing like peace. Maybe you're an addict. Maybe you're addicted to something and you're driven at times and you, you try to get free and you try to get free and you try to get free. I want to tell you, the enemy has a, he's, he's, got a, he's a liar and he tries to pull your chain once in a while to pull you back. And I'm telling you, you don't have to live like that. But it's not about you white knuckling. I, I, I won't drink again. I won't. Uh, just, uh, I'll never uh, hit that porn channel again. I, 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 uh, and you'd white knuckle it. I'm telling you, the freedom that's in Jesus is a. You kind of lay back into it. It's you. You walk it out. But but the, but it's it's you walking. It's not you trying. It's you yielding. You understand? It's never about our works. It's always about what he's done by grace through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God lest any man should boast. Don't mistaken or miss out on your freedom that you already have because you're looking for it to be something else. I want to preach to you a little bit today for the final few minutes I have, and I want to say this to you. Can you hear me okay? The oil you need is in the house. The oil you need 
is in the house. It's in your connection. If Jesus is in your heart by faith and you're connected, committed to the house of God, the Holy Ghost is in the house too. Your anointing oil is in the house of God. We live in a time where very few people actually understand covenant relationships, God's way of bringing families together. Nearly two-thirds of people choose living together as the first option before marriage, not realizing they've actually set statistically, the same stats that I have, statistically, did you know the divorce rate is higher among people that, that live together first and then got married later? Why? Because the whole thing is about an easy out. The covenant of God is a covenant love where there's not an easy out. It is a relationship where he's not looking to go, ah, I don't feel it anymore. Can you imagine? Listen, aren't aren't you glad you're not God? I mean, listen, if if I was God, I would get up some days and somebody would be asking for a miracle. I'd go, no, I don't feel like a miracle today. I I know what you did last night. No. That's not the way our God is. He looks at everyone that's in Christ. He looks at what Jesus did last night, not what you did last night. And we forget that. Listen, I love this verse. 2 Corinthians 5 says this. He made him... God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to become sin for us on the cross that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Not have, not have the righteousness of God in Christ, not visit the righteousness of God in Christ, become, read it, become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's why that when the Bible, it used to mess me up when I was a Presbyterian many years ago because I, when I would read uh, James chapter 5, it says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I would go, but I'm not righteous. I'm not righteous. I, I've messed up. I'm so human. I had all these problems, all these things going on in my life. Years later when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and God began to really deal with the depths of my of my sin and the depths of what I had still held on to in my memory, what the enemy kept beating me with, blackmailing me with, at that point, something happened and God said, no, 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 you, you are righteous because my righteousness is a gift to you. And when you receive Jesus, righteousness is in the gift. It's in the same package. It's in the same box. Are you getting this today? So we, we beat ourselves up over and over again, and the enemy will use every opportunity to beat you for sure. The kingdom of God working through the local church is certainly an army, but it's also a family. And if you want the anointing oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, it's already flowing in God's house. You, have, you just have to jump into the flow. Your breakthrough, some of you need a breakthrough desperately this week. Some of you in Seward, you need a breakthrough today. I want to take your breakthrough is in the house. It's in the now word. It's in the word as it comes forth. We live, listen, Jesus said this, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every now word, every time God speaks, that word is life to our spirit. It changes us from the inside out. Your breakthrough's in the house. The flow of your life is largely affected by your connection to God's house. Now listen, Uh, I'm the first to admit, you don't have to go to church to go to heaven. But you do to bring heaven to earth. And when Jesus prayed the Lord's Prayer, he didn't say, um, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He didn't say, he didn't say this, he didn't say, Receive me so I can go to heaven when I die. So you want to know how to pray? Let your kingdom come and your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. You're not alive here and saved just so you can go to heaven when you die. I believe in heaven. Don't misunderstand me. I'm thankful for heaven. I'm thankful it's it's a promise of eternity in the presence of God. But the job of people that have a relationship with Jesus is to draw heaven to earth, not just keep trying to go to heaven. We're not trying to get to heaven faster. We're trying to take people forward in their lives and bring heaven to them. There are people right around you in your neighborhood that right now, they can't imagine a worse hell than they went through last night. They can't imagine it. And when they see you, they see the light. They see the light. 
um, yesterday morning when I was in the hotel resting from Friday night, I was trying to sleep in and get my voice back. And, you know, you don't know when you close the curtains at night on a hotel um, if you left any cracks open where the light would come in. You can't see it at night. When that sun came up, that just that little crack, that, man, it hit my eyes. I was like, oh, no, this is... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not a morning person. Anyway, I just was like, oh, my gosh. I got, and I had to get some stuff, and I had to, I had to fix it up and, and kind of uh, rig it up and put something in front of it and block it again. But I'm telling you, you the, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You're the light to lost people. And that right now, sometimes they're, they're dwelling in darkness. They don't know. But when the light rises, the Bible says, arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For deep darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're the city on a hill that cannot be hidden. I'm telling you, God wants to do something great. You're supposed to bring heaven to earth. You're not supposed to just wait on a, you know, we're not, we don't, we don't receive Jesus and then go sit on a bus bench waiting for the rapture. That's religion. That's religious absurdity. That's when we, all we are, that's when your trinity is me, myself, and I instead of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. No, 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 it's about others, others. What are other people going through? You can grow in God. Let me just say this real quickly here. I am never going to apologize for raising our children in the church of Jesus. I've heard all this nonsense about people that have been raised in church and just mocking it. And, you know, even my, one of my favorite comedians is uh, Nate Bargatze. He was, uh, he's, uh, he was on College Game Day yesterday. And he was on, he hosted Saturday Night Live last week. He was raised as a born again spiritual Christian in Tennessee. And he makes a joke sometimes that he said, uh, My parents raised me in, he said, I think the, the, the Christians of the 80s and early 90s, I think it was the most Christian generation. He said, I think Jesus had more fun than I did. And he talked about the stuff that he didn't do and the stuff that he couldn't do. I want to tell you this. We had our kids at church, when we started uh, our church 33 years ago, we had church Sunday morning, we had Sunday night, we had Tuesday night midweek, and we had Friday night prayer. The first 12 years of our church, we had all those every week, and people came, and people were excited. They they weren't as as distracted. Something happened in the early 2000s where people started uh, a bunch of the people that we were winning to the Lord when we first started the church, we started church, we were 29 years old. And, uh, and so the, a lot of the people we were winning were in teenagers and early 20s. Well, about the time that they started having their kids and their kids started to go play sports, it's like our midweeks went <laughs> right down. Distractions, all kinds of stuff. Nothing wrong with sports, don't get me wrong. But I'm just telling you, I will never apologize for raising our kids in the priority of the house of God. I will never apologize for raising them. Some of you might remember Integrity's Hosanna music. Anybody remember that? One person in the whole house. Well, okay, wow. Wow, man, that's crazy. Um, do you, you, you remember, um, uh, anybody remember Salty the Singing Songbook? There you go, okay. So we got a second person right there. If, if you want to get a hoot, look up on YouTube Salty the Singing Songbook. This was a character that would scare most kids. But we raised our kids, they were singing songs, but the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So camping, kids. I'll never apologize for that. It's, it seems hokey and weird now. Gospel Bill, I remember, remember Gospel Bill? Okay, a few more remember Gospel Bill. I'm tell, I'll never apologize because we raised our kids in, a, in an awareness of Jesus, even in our entertainment stuff and the stuff we had. God wants to do something. There's a miracle in the house. There's a miracle in your house. And I want to say this to you. We come together because we love the presence of the oil. We come together. Listen, the prophet said to the woman, you want a breakthrough? Go into the house. Bring your kids with you and lock the door. That's what he said. Now, he's not talking about church per se. He's talking about her house physically. But I want to just give that parallel right there. There's nothing wrong. Listen, don't apologize. A lot of people right now are telling me, well, I, I wanted to bring my 13-year-old to church, but they didn't want to come. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You know, my parents said to me, I was raised a Methodist the first 10 years and then Presbyterian. 
And my parents said, you have no option, buddy. You live in this house. We're going to church. Now, I never heard the gospel in that church. I made paper airplanes in the balcony and flew them down to my parents' detriment once in a while. Embarrassment. But the reality was I was in the house. I was in there, and something was happening, and I didn't know it. The, the memory verses and things we had to do got inside me. I didn't know it. Some, God was whittling away at the hardness of my heart. And some, some, and my parents, when I, when I, got to, uh, when I finally was driving, uh, they said, uh, no, you have to be in church every Sunday unless you have a job on Sundays. So I found jobs on Sundays so I could get away from church. And God got the last laugh anyway because at 19... I cried out to him anyway. I, here's the thing. When I felt called to preach, I was 22 years old, and I wrestled with God. I, thought, I said, God, why? How, how can you use me to be a preacher, a pastor? I hate church. I hate it because it's boring. And God said, I want you to change it. When we started our church in 1990, we were the first church in our community, our whole city, a very Baptist community, we were the first church in our city to do praise and, worship, praise and worship instead of hymns. And we put up with all kinds of grief about it. Oh, you're, you're neglecting the hymns of the church and the first, sing the first and second and third and fifth stands. I don't know why nobody ever sang stands number four. They just always went to the first and second and the fifth stanza. What happened to three and four? I don't know. We didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't qualify. But now all those churches that used to mock us 33 years ago are all doing praise and worship today, or at least a contemporary service. Let me tell you something. God, God will call you to be a, a world changer. He wants to do something great. i got to hurry. i got to hurry. i got to hurry. Listen, one little jar of oil becomes the catalyst for a never-ending overflow. She got those sons in the house. We got to get our kids in the house again. There's a ghost in this house. He's the Spirit of Jesus, the Almighty King of kings and Lord of lords. The oil is the anointing. And that one little jar of oil can become the catalyst for a never-ending overflow. That's what happened to this woman. Her miracle was in the house, in the jar, a little jar of oil. There's a miracle in the house. But we need the spiritual sons and daughters to knock on the doors and gather the empty vessels. We need you to gather the empty vessels. I'm so glad Pastor Matt mentioned about people that were, uh, your job is to find someone to pray for and trust God. Your job is to pray for somebody for, by the end of the year and believe for them to come to church with you. Can I tell you something? That's the key to unlock the oil. You got to keep getting new vessels, new vessels, new vessels. The, the oil stopped the moment they ran out of vessels, the moment they ran out of people, the other people that they were concerned about, everything stopped. If we ever run out of empty vessels, the oil stops flowing here too. And pastors can pour out the oil, but pastors need the sons and daughters of the house to go gather the vessels and bring them in. We need you to do your job, do what you're called to do. I'm almost done. I'll finish with this thought. I may believe we may be living in the last days. There's just a lot, a lot of stuff going on in the world, and people are freaked out about it. Hey, hey let, let me just tell you, whatever happens in the end times, the church, it's our best time. Read the scriptures. Matthew 23, Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end of time. Matthew 25, he starts talking about the parable of the talents, being careful to make sure you're multiplying your gifts, talents, and resources. He didn't say go bury it. In fact, he punished the guy that buried it. And then he gives a parable called the parable of the ten virgins. And he says this. He said there were ten virgins. Uh, now five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps. I mean, you know, the, the lamp of the, of the Lord is, uh, is the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? So the lamp is the word. So all ten virgins, they were pure and they were virgins. But they had, and they all had lamps. But the Bible says those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. All were virgins, all had lamps, all only had, but only five had oil. And when they heard the call of the bridegroom, the Bible says that they turned to the people that had the oil and said, give us some of your oil. And they said, no, we can't. You have to get this oil for yourself. 
you can't get grandma's oil. You can't get grandpa's oil. You can't, can't live off your mama's oil. You can't live off your cousin's oil. You have to get this oil for yourself. You have to have an experience with God for yourself. You can't just go through the motions. It's the flow of the Holy Spirit that quickens the living word, making it understandable and applicable to every situation. Where's your oil? Some of you had the oil and you left it somewhere. You left it because you wouldn't forgive someone that messed around or messed up with, messed up your life. You're blaming somebody and you have no more oil. Did you run out because you stopped gathering empty vessels? Because you started caring about yourself more than everybody else's needs? Because I'm telling you, the oil, the miracle of the multiplication of the oil is in the distribution to find those vessels and the oil will keep pouring. The mama said, son, bring me another vessel. He said, I don't have any more. And the oil stopped. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit in our church more than we ever have.